pledge, followed by a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right. Do we have? I'm. I yes. Audrey is online, and so we are good to go. Our our county council uh, for the uh, for the knowledge of the audience. Uh, our county council is on parental leave, and uh, so we have contract council joining us online. And uh, Audrey is going to be presenting our first agenda item 3A, hearing on a design build procurement of a water treatment facility at Laverne Park and also at West Laverne Park. Good morning, Councillor. Oh, we don't have audio. You're muted there. He's muted. He needs to unmute. Okay, how's that? There she goes. Yeah. All, All good? Still, yeah, we got you now. Okay, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> so um, this agenda item is simply for the Board of Commissioners to review and approve the draft findings that were submitted in support of use of the design build procurement method for the construction of the water treatment facilities at Laverne Park and West Laverne Park. Um, traditionally, um, for all public improvement projects, such as this one, design bid um, build contracting is used. It's all competitive bidding. Um, this requires competitive seal building and for the county commissioners to accept the lowest responsible bid. Uh, use of the competitive or of the design build procurement method offers advantages for projects which require specialized experience or expertise or um, other conditions related to the project as documented in the findings submitted in support of this. Um, use of the design build contracting method, especially through the competitive proposals, which are proposed here. So a two-step process where requests for proposals will be requested and then those responses will be evaluated allows for the county to realize the cost savings benefits while still considering other factors such as specialized experience or expertise um, with the type of project at issue. So notice of the proposed design build procurement method is required. That notice was published in the da Daily Journal of Commerce on March 18th. And the purpose of this hearing is to receive comments on the proposed findings. All right. Thank you very much, Councillor. Do we have a motion? Uh, Mr. Chair, move to approve and sign order 24-03-044L, approving alternative contracting method under ORS 279C.335. And I second that motion. Okay, motion is second. Any discussion on the board? No. Nope. Any nope. discussion in the room? Any discussion online? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Audrey. Appreciate your assistance with that. Moving on to item 4A, a Tour de France, Commissioner Maine. I am pleased to present Donna Freeman, who I do believe is the chair of the Tour de France for hours. They have an annual event which has grown exponentially and now they're gonna have to cut off people <laughs> because they have too many. Good morning, Donna. Has Tour de France ever received an award for creativity and naming convention? No? Okay. Well, they should, because it's great. Good morning, Donna. Good morning, and thank you for inviting me. I just want to share a little information about Tour de France. This will be the 25th year for Tour de France, so we're celebrating with our 25th anniversary. Um, let me just give a short, brief history. The first ride was in 1998 with 69 riders. And Tour de France was sponsored by the Umpois Bello Club in Roseburg. 
and Paul and Betty Tam were the coordinators, and um, Ride were in Powers and Glendale during those years. And they served as the coordinator for 10 years, and then uh, Dave Anderson took it over for the next four years. And during those years, there were lots of changes, um, improvements and such. But in 2012, um, Paul Bello decided they didn't want to do it anymore, and Glendale didn't feel like they had the volunteers left to continue it. So it was up to Powers. And we just had Cycle Oregon come through Powers in 2011, so a lot of us were excited about bicycle riders <coughs> coming to Powers. So we said, okay, let's form a committee. And we formed a committee, and in 2013, we did the same thing. We sent a group of our people over to Glendale, <coughs> and we had a group in Powers to you know, take care of the ride. Well, the group that went to Glendale said, no, that's too much. So we decided the committee, we formed a, a good committee, and we decided to give it a try to start and end all rides in Powers. And it has continued to this day. So all the rides start and end in Powers. <coughs> um, with the work of the committee over the years, we started at 69 the first year that we took it over. And we went up to th two years where we had 300 ride riders. And that, those were the years right before COVID. And then we shut down for two years um, during COVID. Um, the first year coming back, we had 177 riders. Last year we had 212 riders. And at this point, this year, I already have 180 riders. That was when I left home this morning, so I'm not sure where it is now. Um, we are planning to limit the number of riders to 250. It's just more manageable for our volunteers, and it creates a more personal environment because a lot of people come back to meet friends or they bring friends and they meet family, and so it's kind of a unique experience. Right now we have 135 that are registered that live in Oregon, 28 from California. We have a group from Santa Rosa Cycling Club that loves to come up and they're bringing about 20 to 25 riders. So wow. we're excited about that. Um, we have 11 from Washington State and some from Utah, or no, Idaho and New Mexico. We've even had riders that have come as far away as South Carolina um, mm. and other places. So. And what's interesting this year is we've got 107 returning riders and we have 73 that are brand new to the oh. ride. So friends and family are sharing the information about our ride. We have several rides for the rider that doesn't want to go too far <laughs> and the rider that's um, the enthusiast. Um, they can choose to go to Daphne Grove and we have rest stops at all of these places I'll mention. Go up to Eden Valley, uh, Araska Saddle, or they can do this cruiser loop, and that this year it's a 117-mile loop. So, And that, that ride changes every year. Slim Stopper, my road guy and map guy, is always changing that one to make it a longer or shorter ride, but it's always around 100 or more. And it's amazing, we've had you know, 17, 20 riders that choose to do that ride. Um, we also have Agnes Pass. They can ride up to Agnes Pass and come back. And this year our um, asphalt gravel ride is over to Singing Springs. Go up to Agnes Pass, go down the old road, go to Singing Springs, and then come back upon the new road. We were a little worried about that for a while when that road blew out, but they assured me they we're able to get it fixed and they will finish patching it up um, once <coughs> the weather gets dry enough to do so. This takes a huge number of volunteers um, to cover all aspects of the ride. We have the Coos County Ham radio operators and those that are from um, Gold Beach also that come and help us so we can keep track of all the riders. Uh, we have SAG drivers on the road. We have hosts and hostesses at all the rest stops and volunteers that help with registration, with meals, you name it, they, we need volunteers. Um, Mike Moe from Moe's Bicycle Shop in North Bend always comes and helps us out and has his repair trucks there for those cyclists that need help. We also have Willie Burris <coughs> that comes up with the ambulance and goes up to Eden Valley. He says that's his vacation day. <laughs> so 
We are appreciative of all those that have uh, that help. Um, this event has a big impact on the Powers County Park. I think all, well, I know all the cabins have been rented, and I'm not sure about the RV spots, but I'm sure they're filling up quickly. It's basically a weekend for the cyclists. On Friday night, we have a group from the high school that prepare a um, pasta dinner, and um, then on Saturday, the, reg the registration fee for the riders covers all their meals. The breakfast, continental breakfast on the uh, county park, uh, basketball court mm -hmm. and then all the refreshments along the route at the rest stops there. Lots of drinks, lots of snacks, our famous um, <coughs> big cookie that we have, a <laughs> monster cookie um, is a favorite. And um, then after they finish the ride, they come back to Ross Hall where they serve a pasta, I mean a lasagna dinner with salad and French bread and homemade dessert and that's always a highlight. Um, this year we're including a t-shirt with our little redesigned logo on it for all the riders that register. On Sunday morning, to complete the weekend, the Lions have a Father's Day uh, pancake feed at Ross Hall, which is a fundraiser for them, and it's for the cyclists that stay in town and for people in Powers, and we've had people even from Coquille and Goose Bay come up and enjoy that breakfast. Um, so it's a whole weekend uh, event. Like I said before, a lot of people meet up with family. I have one of our riders that lives in Mexico. His brother lives in Portland, and their mom is in Bandon, so it's time for them to get together, and they come up and, and do the ride and spend the weekend with their mom. The ride itself sells itself because of the beauty of the area where they ride, and they're on, it's on low traffic roads, so um, it's a nice place to ride, especially for friends that come from Portland or for Mica from metropolitan areas. Um, if you have friends that are interested in riding, be sure and <laughs> get their registrations in because we say June the 9th is, no, hmm? yeah, June the 9th is our cutoff time because the ride is early this year with it being on the 15th of June. So get their registrations in because if they hit 250, we're gonna close registration and start a, a wait list. Um, so, um, also at this time of the year, I always get very concerned about the safety of our riders staying at the park. And as you know, the situation in Powers, we do not have law enforcement. And I'm always concerned, so I'm always reaching out to the counties to help us in any way they can. They can because you know a lot of the riders have very spendy bicycles and I hate to have to go around at the pasta dinner saying be sure you sleep with your bicycle but I do because I don't want anything happening to those. Actually we just had somebody trying to <coughs> help himself to the decorated bike that's right there chained at the park um, <coughs> at night and that was an interesting experience. Um, we, I'm also part of the Powers Action Team uh, group and we have just recently provided funds to build bunk beds in the cabins and provide mattresses. So we are trying to help. We also appreciate the county park um, for kind of getting it spruced up during this time after winter, getting all the branches and stuff cleaned up. So just to make it a nice place. Um, and so riders feel like they want to come back whether we have a ride or not. Just one final note, um, over the years, we've been able, with the funds that come in through our registration, been able to support our service organizations in Powers, the Lions, the, Lion, the Lioness, um, Powers Action Team, and others, or wherever we might see a need in the community that we can put funds toward. And since probably, not the first couple of years, but since probably about 14 or 15, We've been able to donate $37,000 back into the community that we have raised from our experience with this. You can find us on Facebook. You'll see our colored bicycles because I have a new person that's taking care of cleaning the bicycles, which is a, a burden off of my shoulders. Or you can find us on tourdefrance.com. And we are busy putting together a history of Tour de France. It might be slanted a little bit towards the power side, but that's where we have most of the information. Um, just one more note. Uh, May 18th, 
is our fishing derby in Powers. Uh, June 1st will be our town-wide garage sale. <laughs> and of course, June 15th, Tour de, Tour de France. Do any of you have questions for You forgot me? the 4th of July. And 4th of July, White uh -huh. Cedar Day. White yes, Cedar Day, yes. yeah. Once June hits, when May hits, Powers people are busy, and especially if you're a volunteer, <laughs> almost too busy. So when is it again? June 15th. <coughs> Through the 17th? It starts on June the 14th, oh, 14th. The Friday night dinner, and then the 15th is the ride, and mm -hmm. then the 16th is the breakfast. So I just texted the sheriff. He says, I believe we can make the patrols happen up there. <gasps> oh, that's awesome. Thank mm -hmm. you, thank you. Is he here? No, he had to leave. I just saw him come in. Yeah, he was here for a little bit, and he got called away. Oh, good. But oh, he answered my text anyway. Such a relief. Uh, so important. We want people to come back to the Powers County Park. Oh, I did skip over one thing that I forgot to mention. Um, Powers Action Team got a grant from Cycle Oregon several years ago, and we used that money along with money from the county uh, partnered, and we repainted the tennis court, and we also changed one of the tennis courts into two pickleball courts. So. People can come and play pickleball in Powers, <laughs> and some of us do. <laughs> Very good. Any other questions? <coughs> Just a comment, and that is for anyone who hasn't gone up there uh, and participated. It's a wonderful event. I've done it a couple of times. I may have out, out aged it, but um, the comments that uh, I'm, I'm thinking of a comment from a group from Seattle, and they, they go everywhere to write. And they say, no one does it like this. Uh, there was food, there was direction along the way so you can't get lost. Uh, at, the, at the turnaround points, they have food, they have music, they have a fire. It, 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 it's, it's an amazing event, so well done. And Donna's been very free with her giving credit to everyone else, but uh, she's the mm -hmm. one that puts this together. And the attention to detail is, is beyond anything you could imagine. So thank you, Donna. Well, this is important not only for Powers, but for all of us in the county. It it's is. a great event. It is, and we do have a lot of people from the county that come and ride. A lot of them wait till the last minute. <laughs> but well, Check um, on the weather. Yes, because of the weather. You know, I have the poster that we always put up, and this family rides with us every year. and. Um, <coughs> the dad is pulling a tag along, and the mom is pregnant, and now they're up to three children, and all three children are riding in the oh, ride with us. So we, you know, they're a Coos County couple, and we appreciate, you know, their participation. So. Very nice. Okay. Thank you so much, Donna. Thank, Thank you. you for all Thank the work. Thank you for all you do. Yeah. Thank you. All right, moving right on to uh, 4B, Coos Health and Wellness Transfer of Appropriation of 021 Funds. Resolution 2403053B, and you are not Mike Rowley. Good uh, morning, Eric. How I are you not today? We have similar features. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, commissioners. Uh, Coos Health and Wellness is requesting the transfer of $350,000 from contingency funds to 1,300 admin due to unrecognized expenses with increased costs for 23-24 fiscal year. Increasing three six dash three hundred fifty thousand dollars. Motion. I move we approve and sign resolution twenty four dash zero three dash zero five three B. Third. Motion and a second. So uh, our unrecognized expense with increased costs is this just across the board increased costs or? There's, there's a significant number. Uh, we had a, quite a increase in, in need for funds around our network disruption uh, oh, yeah. testing that went along with that to make right. sure that we didn't have those issues in the, in the future, mm -hmm. as well as some uh, leadership training for our management staff. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, any other discussion? Nope. In the room, any discussion? Jim? James Bennett, Bandit, I'm glad that you uh, uh, provided for public comment before making a decision. As far as I'm concerned, and people I know, that would be a no. Why does health, Coos Health and Wellness have more money in the coffers than our, than our county does? This 
Kuhn's Health and Wellness in the Devereaux Center <coughs> may sound benign, but it's anything, the efforts are anything but. When you look at, when you look at both, it's hard to figure out where all these zeros are going. And uh, no, I, I, that would be a no for me. They already have plenty of funding. And I believe through the COVID pandemic and everything, I think that Coos Health and Wellness has already shown uh, where they stand with we the people. So for me, it would be a definite no. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, so, and I just want to, I'll take this opportunity to clarify that um, health and wellness funding does not come from the county itself. It comes from state and federal grants and programs. And this agenda item is not providing additional funding to health and wellness. It's actually just uh, uh, permitting the appropriation of funds from, from one account to another so that they can cover some of these e additional expenses. Um, and the, the, uh, the email, uh, well, the, the technological problem that they had was chief among those. And so one of the expenses that they didn't anticipate was having to pick up part of a, a, another IT director. So uh, anyway, that, that's, it's really, it's not providing any, it's not taking any funds from any other account in the county. It's all within health and wellness. So that having been said, any other discussion in the room? Chris? I'm looking online, I don't see any hands up there. I'm Chris Castleman. Uh, I had a question, um, this is about um, them not budgeting correctly or having unexpected expenses, correct? Unexpected, unanticipated cost increases and additional expenses. You know, they couldn't have anticipated the uh, email problem, the computer problem that they had. So, you know, that was, that was uh, a lot of money that had to be spent to, to resolve that situation. Okay, so uh, two weeks ago at the budget hearings, um, they spoke of $40,000 that they used for snacks at the LaSalle or LaClaire location. Mm -hmm. And um, it was approved for them to buy those snacks for, I guess they said the homeless people get hangry and they're hard to deal with during their appointments. So they give them snacks like candy bars and gummy bears and <coughs> things like that. Um, and then the budget was proposed, it's not finalized, but it was allowed to go through and continue that for next year, that they'll be allowed to spend $40,000 on snacks for homeless people. Um, I mean, how, how do you balance them asking for mo more money for unknown expenses, but then they're spending $40,000 on snacks for hangry people? Well, that's a, that's a question. I, I would guess that not all the people that were hungry were homeless. Uh, I'm just going based off uh, what Mike Rowley said yeah. when I asked him who they I, were for. I, yes, it, that's right. Perhaps once in a while someone omits something. So uh, we have a lot of families that come there <coughs> for health services, and I see a lot of children when I go there. Uh, I think, um, and again, this is not giving them more money. This is they're simply transferring money from one right, part of their like budget allowance. to another. Like it's their own money, but you guys kind of tell them that they're allowed to spend it. But um, I don't know. It's just 40000 for snacks is a little crazy. It's like $800 a week for gummy bears and granola bars. So um, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure the email stuff was unexpected. I get that. Things come up throughout the year. That's what a contingency is for. But tax dollars are not for candy bars for homeless people. Any other comments in the room? I might, Mr. Chair, I might say that um, it's not health and wellness is doing when you have the governor, previous governor, letting out multiple many people with mental issues out back onto the streets with no, re no way to, to fend for themselves is not a service for them. 
as well as there's a lot of service to the community. And then you have Measure 110, bringing folks from all over the country here to do have drugs of any sort they want for personal use. Uh, that's another issue, and all those issues, health and wellness is having to deal with. And they're overwhelmed with those folks. And to try and get them sort of calm down a little bit, they feed them a little bit, and their blood sugar comes back up because they're hungry all the time because they don't eat. So that's the issue they have. Okay. Huh? On Brown Street Bay, I'd like to add that we also have to deal with them. Yeah. That's what I said. I was curious, do you guys have oversight over who's health and wellness? Yes. yes. You're responsible for the funding and mm -hmm. or to see, make sure you. Well, we we are responsible for authorizing uh, certain but expenditures you say, that no, there's. You can't there. have the money because you're not appropriating it right, or. Uh, yes, we could. Yeah, we can. We can do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Any other comments in the room? Yes, Tim. Band in Oregon. Uh, if you guys have to say so over this stuff, why don't you just simply shut this thing down? The money well, that we waste over here could be used for the jailhouse, just like this nice lady that was talking well, about worrying about no. people, no. about people uh, <laughs> being protected and having the police come. The reason they have to is because we ain't putting people in jail. We're putting the money over here. Hey, Tim, that money is not for general fund, it is designated as grant funds, can only be used for health and wellness purposes. Well, just, uh, get, just don't give it to them. It comes from Maybe the state and feds, yeah. You know, I, I just don't get this business, you know, and grant money is like, is this like money that comes from heaven? This is all taxpayer money. Too. I got that part, yes. You know, I mean, yeah. I, just don't get, I just don't get this. But it can't be, tran to it can't be transferred to law enforcement. Is this, this, this is, but they're just, a, I call them who's hell on welfare is what I call them, but they're just like a huge empire within the county, and they, they wield all this power, and every time I come here, I see more money, more money, more money going to these people. But I don't see a penny going to the jailhouse. Yeah. Thank you. So, the, you know, the reality that has been oft repeated from this dais is that is that Coos Health and Wellness is not funded directly by taxpayers of Coos County. It is true that there is a portion of their funding that is indirectly funded by the people of Coos County, just as it is from every other county in the, in the state, and to some degree, every county in the nation, because those funds are taxpayer funds that come back through grants and programs from the state and federal level. It is not county funds. We cannot, there is no possible way in God's universe for this funding to be utilized in the jail unless, I mean, there's just not. It's, it's, not, it's not possible. That's not what, the, the funding that's appropriated toward health and wellness is, is obligated under intergovernmental agreements how it has to be utilized, period. That's the way it is. And, and I want to additionally say that although there have been, uh, there have been uh, undertakings and projects at health and wellness that I have disagreed with, as well as I'm sure many of you, the fact of the matter is that on balance, this organization provides a, a, a lot of very valuable services to a very susceptible and vulnerable portion of our population that doesn't have access to these services otherwise. That's the reality. And, um, you know, you can argue with that, but you know what, we're gonna be just agreeing to disagree, I guess, unless you've gone out there and actually seen what's happening, uh, then, you know, I suggest if, if you haven't, then maybe that would be a good exercise to undertake. Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. And it irritates me to no end 
when you read a couple of weeks ago in the paper, the legislature allocated $372 million for homeless. Nothing for the district attorney, the sheriff, the jail, dispatch, any of that. Mm-hmm. But they're going to $372 million for homeless. What? Wait a minute. Where's the priorities? Jim, give you one more shot. Jim Bennett, man. The reason we've lost the sovereignty of our community because we've hitched our wagon to Salem and all the appropriations and everything that are driving her nuts. And our Constitution, our rule book, has so many instruments of local control that if we re- explained them, pe- pe- most people would say, I never even heard of that before. I know it's not easy. I know they're completely completely entangled themselves in our affairs through an alphabet of these NGOs. We might do well to remember what NGO stands for, but uh, they make it like your hands are tied. Your hands aren't tied. I know it would be very difficult to undo it, but undo it. We must. Thanks. Thank you. So be that as it may, Authorizing funds transfers to in order to pay obligations is not uh, the area is not the the time or place to um, engage that kind of an action. So, any other comments? First and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Four uh, C. PH aid to physician. Does that mean public health or physicians aid? I don't. What is that? It's a <laughs> public health. Aid. Okay. Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, under public health, a public health aid one under the WIC program, which is Women, Infant, Children program, is eligible to advance to public health aid two classification upon completion of all required WIC certified training. The public health aid one job description states the following public health aid one employee shall be eligible for reclassification to public health aid two status upon successful demonstration of these duties and responsibilities, successfully complete assigned training, and maintenance of a full caseload. Public Health Aid 1, Chloe Routon, has completed the obligations above and is eligible to advance to Public Health Aid 2 position. Request board approval reclassification for Chloe Routon from Public aid, Public Health Aid 1 to Public Health Aid 2, Step 1, effective April 1, 2024, and also approve payroll resolution 24-03-0452. Move to approve as stated. I don't want to do that again. <laughs> and I'll second that. Okay, motion a second, any discussion? Aye. No. Any discussion in the room? Any discussion online? I see no hands up. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Six A, we'll move to uh, late agenda item six A, if you would, gentlemen, please. While Dr. Gleason is here, uh, request to start new hire above step two, Dr. Gleason. Uh, request for the hiring of Charity Smith at Step 3 for the Mental Health Specialist 3 Grief Hate Crisis Program Manager position. Charity has worked in behavioral health for more than 12 years in various capacities. She currently holds licensure as a professional counselor. Charity brings with her a well-rounded clinical skill set and background. She also brings supervisory experience. Okay. I move we approve hiring of Charity Smith at Step 3 for the Mental Health Specialist three brief crisis program manager position. Second. First and a second. Any discussion? Board. Okay. And I'll just mention as a precursor that there there is an ongoing challenge at health and wellness to find qualified candidates who are willing to come and move to this area or who even more rarely already live here, and the the hiring environment. In this on this patch is particularly competitive and the private sector uh, operations that we're competing with in that hiring uh, realm are you know have have greater resources at their disposal so uh, we're we're fortunate to find uh, good qualified candidates and even though we are under budgetary constraints in the general fund areas of the county's budget uh, health and wellness has adequate resources to, to uh, 
uh, offer these kinds of incentives to qualified candidates and thus help fulfill their mission. Any other discussion in the room? Any online? Seeing none, all in favor? No. Aye. Aye. Thank you, commissioners. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Eric. 4D, Rotary Coos Foundation Grant and Resolution 24030054B. We'll see you soon, though, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> you don't look like Lisa. Good morning, Lisa. Good morning. How are you all? <laughs> Great. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank right you. For nice try, me. Paul. <laughs> I had to get back to work. Hi, Lisa. Hello. So I am here today to request that you guys approve a resolution 24-03-054B um, as the Rotary Coos Foundation approved and granted the fair $4,639. And we would like to appropriate those funds to be able to use now towards the Clarino bathroom upgrade downstairs. I move approving resolution 2403054B. Second. First and a second. Any discussion? In the room? Online? All in favor? Aye. 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 I would like to say thank you to the Rotary, if you wouldn't mind giving them our yeah. thanks. And to all mm -hmm. of us and all of you who are involved with the fair, you did a, a great job upgrading our fairgrounds. Thank you. A lot it's of been work. a lot of fun, and yeah. there's been a lot of volunteers. I see several of them right now. There's several in the room, along with very, uh, there's a large amount of community members that are down there daily making our That's fair right. sounds great. So the fair is a group of volunteers to yep. make that happen. So thank you very with much. The, I appreciate with your the time. capable leader. Thank you. <laughs> <for> <laughs> well, I do appreciate that compliment. Thank you guys. Happy thank day. you, Lisa. Thanks, Lisa. Okay, 4E, Mr. Slater. <laughs> oh, I thought we were going to skip <laughs> over it. Intergovernmental agreement with ODOT and Coos County regarding U OR 42 US 101 to Cedar Point Road project. Good morning, Paul. Good morning. Um, so ODOT has a large project plan. It's out a couple years, I think, um, between Cedar Point Road, which is right outside of Townsville, over to the junction with uh, 101 on Highway 42. As part of that project, they want to expand the access and entrance into Polito Road, which is a county road. Uh, just past the waste hills outside of Townsville. And so we've agreed to let them expand that. Uh, they're going to lengthen the culvert and put a catch basin in there and then uh, <coughs> a wider entrance and make it better for vehicles to get in on and off Polito Road. On that Is that the south, south or south the north end? The south, south, south end? end? Yeah, closer to the mm -hmm. stadium. Yeah. So our cost is zero. We're just allowing them to do it and then saying that we will basically maintain it once it's done. Okay. I move we approve and sign the IGA with uh, ODOT, uh, or between ODOT and Coos County regarding Oregon Highway 42, US 101 to Cedar Point Road project. Second. First and a second, any discussion? Nope. Any discussion in the room? Online? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 4F, amendment number one to the contract with TNT construction and excavation for road maintenance and repairs. Yeah, as you recall, uh, a while back, um, we had got board approval to hire two local contractors to help us with some emergency road repairs and maintenance work just to help get caught up and way behind with all the storm damage. Mm -hmm. TNT was one of those two contractors and um, they had some additional work to do that Code the 4971587, we're just requesting an amendment. This would have normally went through a post-action notification, but without our inside counsel's order, uh, it's recommended amendment to, to stay in place. Okay, okay. So motion. I move we approve amendment number one with TNT construction and excavation um, and authorize road department to sign for an amount not to exceed $49,000. $715.87. Second. Any discussion? Any discussion in the room? Online? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Well, we have Paul here. Can you give us a brief rundown uh, along with everyone else uh, in the room about the amount of storm damage and, and the projects that we have directly related to yeah. this year's heavy rains? Um, 
Before you do yeah, that, I'll excuse myself for just I'll try to be quick and brief here. Um, right now, we're working with ODOT and Federal Highway Administration on 21 locations around the county where we had substantial to major uh, storm damage. Probably the biggest one is Old Broadbent Road. We have a quarter mile section of road that's sliding into the southwest of the river. Um, we had to close that road. It's been closed for almost a month. Um, we also had to weight restrict it before that. Once we reopen it, we may still have a weight restriction on it. Um, we'll assess that once we open the road, which the weather will hold. We might be able to get that open by the next week or two. Okay. Um, and um, then we've got 20 other locations that are, you know, small things that were, you know, maybe eight to $10,000 worth of damage up to, you know, six figures. And we're working with ODOT and Federal Highway to try to recoup some of our costs as well as get their help with some uh, long-term permanent repairs. Um, outside of that, we're, we had submitted through Oregon Emergency Management and FEMA and are waiting on a, a declaration from the President's office. Um, if that declaration is made, we'll continue to work with OEM and FEMA to uh, get assistance with the other 30 to 40 sites we have around the county. I don't remember the exact number off the top of my head. Um, we had a lot of smaller damages around the county, you know, um, erosion issues on shoulders, small shoulder failures, plug culverts or roads over top, uh, plug ditches we had to clean, a lot of trees came down. Um, so there's a total of 50 to 60 sites around the county that uh, we've had to do temporary work on and or, you know, final cleanup. And our, our crews did a great job. Um, we were scrambling a lot for weeks. You know, we had three miles of river load. We had three months of almost nonstop rain. Um, definitely above average on the rainfall and it, it caused a lot of road problems. Um, we still have a couple of road issues from the last declaration, which was over a year ago, that we don't have fixed um, that were pretty large. So anyway, this just creates more of a backlog for us because we don't have the funds and the people to, you know, to fix these things quickly. So I ask the public to be, be patient with us. Um, you know, we are trying to do the best we can with what we've got to work with. Uh, it'll take some time, especially the ones, you know, we're working with the federal government to try to get through because all of those projects, if they fund them, they've got to meet all the federal regulations. So uh, those projects usually take quite a bit longer. Thanks, Paul. Yep. So appreciate the update. Um, do we have a schedule for the Kentuck East Bay Drive uh, culvert washout? That one is was an ongoing problem before the storm. But yeah, we have that one scheduled tentatively for June now. We have to wait for I got to coordinate a new in water work stage with OEM. It looks pretty yeah. ugly. It's down to one lane. And yeah, we have it down to one lane. Luckily, it's a straight stretch where there's really good visibility. And um, we have one lane stopping and one lane yielding. Um, that'll continue till we get that replaced. We have the pipe purchased. It's on site. Um, I saw the pipe. Wide area there at the uh, Coos Bay Timber Operators property. They've got a store for us. So mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a two-day project if things go reasonably well. So it's not that big a deal once we get right weather but we were waiting for water levels to come down for a long time yeah if you recall we had that project planned for uh the week that that first big storm hit in december because um, the normal preferred in water work period is december or sorry october to february and so we were going to do it in december but now we're going to have to coordinate a outside the normal in water work period time to do it so it'll be june when we have the next big uh daytime low tide yeah, why I ask is I get calls from neighbors every once in a while. What's the date that you're going to fix this thing? Yeah, it's. I mean, we'll we'll probably get it an actual like solid date put on the schedule here within the next couple of weeks. You know, yeah. we'll build the, we can let them know. So. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Thanks Paul. Time. Have a great day. All right, 4G uh, community corrections approval of safe project contract and Coos County for victim services through the Justice Reinvestment. Program. Good morning, Director Krim. How Good are morning, you today? Good morning, Commissioners. Nice to see you. So uh, here to uh, ask the board to approve the SAFE project contract with Coos County for victim services through the Justice Reinvestment Grant. Uh, the contract provides for a campus outreach advocate and an executive director position for victims at the SAFE project through the JRI grant, State of Oregon. The amount of the grant is $22,436.75 and it's funded by the State of Oregon Criminal Justice Commission. I ask the board to approve the, the contract the, between uh, Coos County and the uh, 
same project for the, the program for the executive director and outreach coordinator from 7123 through 630 to 24. And this is uh, the second uh, part of the 10% out of the grant that's required to go to victims programs. Uh, the last time I appeared in front of the board, that was when we talked about the Kids Hope program. That was the other program that qualified. We have two in Coos County, SAFE and Kids Hope that qualify uh, for that money and uh, both do a fantastic job. Okay. Thank you. Motion. I move we approve uh, of the SAFE project contract and Coos County to provide a campus outreach advocate and an executive director for victim services from July 1, 2023 through June 30, 2024. <laughs> Almost through that. Yes. Almost All got right. to that. Any discussion on the board? Is that, that yeah, Michael, is the date oh, right? Or is no, it 24, 25? Excuse me. Uh, that would be, I switched the dates from, uh, it would be 7 1 24 through 6 30. Uh, 25. 25. Yeah. That okay, feels I'll, uh, I apologize. <laughs> modify <laughs> my, <laughs> modify my I'm in the wrong motion <laughs> to accommodate that. Um, I second on that right. now. Motion and second amended. So a campus outreach advocate, what campus are we talking about? Uh, we're talking about the, uh, where they have a uh, facility where they house people that are involved in the program that are, uh, are, are receiving services that would be at that facility. I see, okay. <laughs> And this contributes to an executive director, I, I assume. I don't know that you can hire one for yes. 22,000. This 000. is a portion of those two okay, positions. Okay, that's right. right. All right. A for small account. portion. Yeah, Whereas, I'll make sure I understood. Uh, those positions cost a lot more than $22,000. We could always hope. What's that? So we could always hope. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but hope is not an effective strategy. <laughs> yeah. All right. Any yeah. other discussion on the board? Mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so it's rec retro. You have you were fluoride too. Okay. All right. Yeah, mm -hmm. oh, okay. That's what it says. Really? Oh, stick with my original. It's probably <laughs> yeah. the always on it, Bobby Brooks. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, Bobby. You Bobby. Well, wait a minute. Is that really what it's supposed to be? I, I think it's just been the way that the state funding took so long to come through. Mm -hmm. and it did take longer than it ever has to yeah. receive those mm -hmm. dollars. Uh, and so that's that's why this happened. Okay. So yeah. primarily yeah. retroactive yeah. authorization. All right. Yeah. Even though they're all employed. What's that? <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So now with all those do clarifications we have to go and made, the motion again. Uh, I guess we do need to reamend the motion back to the original dates. I move approval of the SAFE project contract and Coos County to provide a campus outreach advocate and an executive director for victims services from July 1, 2023 through June 30, 2024. Second. Any discussion in the room? You know, I don't remember verbatim the passage, but the Oregon's Constitution provides that such deliberations are worded in a way that the common man can understand. Well, Salem likes to use all of these acronyms and everything. What does SAFE stand for? How do we know it's SAFE? Well, I don't know that what SAFE stands for, but it's for a, a domestic violence program. That's the, we receive the services, people that have, have a, are victims of abuse and uh, uh, receive services through SAFE. Uh, it's changed names several times. That's the current name and organization, and um, I can't tell you what that stands for. Well, not against this you know, in particular, but I think you know what I mean. They have a quite an affinity for acronyms. And uh, <coughs> uh, the idea is to make it so that people can understand uh, what's going on. Thank you. Thank you. So it's, uh, it doesn't, uh, I'm looking at the, at the website.
for the SAFE organ, I don't see where it's like an acronym or anything. Well, we so don't need to know. Just give them the money. All right. So we're authorizing uh, utilization of a grant that is not Coos County taxpayer money. We have a first and a second. Any other discussion in the room? So SAFE is Safety, Advocacy, Freedom, and Empowerment Program. All right. Well, there you go. Thank you, Commissioner Main. Any discussion online? Seeing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, 4-H, approval of Fifth Amendment Intergovernmental Agreement with the City of Reedsport Jail and Coos County. Uh, ask the board to approve this Fifth uh, Amendment, the Intergovernmental Agreement between the City of Reedsport and Coos County. Uh, this would be uh, the Fifth Amendment. It was for $10,000 for an additional jail bed up there. Uh, we have the agreement attached. attached. This is funded by the State of Oregon Department of Corrections Grant and Aid. Uh, ask the board to approve the IGA Intergovernmental Agreement between the City of Reedsport Jail and Coos County for an additional bed. $10,000 for that additional cost. I move we approve the Fifth Amendment of the IGA between the City of Reedsport Jail and Coos County to change the cost included in the agreement not to exceed $10,000 for an additional bed and authorized chair to sign. I assume this is for a period of a year? Yes. Okay. Second. <laughs> okay, we have a first with an additional question and a second. And uh, so the amount of the contract grant award is 53800 That's That's the total that we're paying to Reedsport for yes. jail beds. Yes. So um, that's... How many, how many beds total then do well, we? Well, we pay for one with the, uh, enough for overflow. We got to keep money so we can pay. What we had, an instance where we had two individuals that committed uh, crimes and we wanted to make sure they were held. One of them was a compact transfer from, from Colorado and I didn't want him being released until he was picked up by the U.S. Marshals and taken back to Colorado. So we had overrun of what we had planned for and so we, my business guy said, well, we need to get some more, more money for that just in case Kay. because we overspent and we had to keep those two individuals held. They both commit new crimes. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. All right, good. And Thank the guy you. was returned to Colorado. Good. So I just a side note, there. I didn't know until months or so ago that the cities in Douglas County all pay to Douglas County for prisoners coming from those cities to the county jail. I didn't know that. Apparently, the city of Eugene also pays Lane County for their prisoners to be held in the county jail. Sounds like a good idea. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can think of four people who wouldn't agree with us, though. Uh, city managers? <laughs> <laughs> and mayors. <laughs> yeah, a whole bunch of them. All right, we have first and a second. Any discussion? More discussion on the board. Any in the room? Tim, get you next, Chris. I don't get this. I'm Tim Pierce, band in Oregon. I don't get this. I thought Reedsport was in Douglas County. I thought this was Coos County here. What on earth are we doing over in Douglas County, you ask? We're renting jail space that I mean, it's not really hard. It's we're renting jail space because we have not, uh, up until right now, we're just on the verge of being able to open up the second pod that's already funded in our jail. So but we don't have the jail capacity to hold these individuals here. They do have it in Reedsport, and so we're having to contract some jail space there. I don't understand what the challenge is there. It's pretty easy oh, to understand. I do. Why aren't we doing it here? <laughs> That's a problem. Well, what do you think? You Why do you think we're not doing it here, Tim? You know, it's easy to step up to this podium and throw fireballs, but the fact of the matter is that the Sheriff's Department has been striving ardently to staff the jail adequately in this very competitive hiring environment that was mentioned regarding Coos Health and Wellness, it also exists in law enforcement. It's not that hard. 
You know, we're not, we're not up here uh, advancing the cause of globalism by renting uh, jail beds from the city of Reedsport. So it's, it's, uh, you know, it's really not that hard to understand. Uh, I'm sorry, Chris had his hand up first before you, Susan. You, you know, you're going to pass on that? Okay, Susan. I'm Susan Wall from Tuesday. I just want to be a voice advocacy. Um, I used to work for a little city of Grand Coulee in Washington and spoke with somebody who still works there. And she, we're not the only ones that are struggling, and I hope that people can hear this. This isn't unique to us. It isn't because there's collusion going on or, or malfeasance going on. It is a difficulty across the board. Uh, they are supposed to have eight officers in that little city there down the street, and they can't find anybody. And they are, as we are, limited in their funding and have to compete. And who wants to move to Grand Coulee, Washington? They don't even know where it is. Um, so I, I used to work there. I used to work at the city hall. I used to work at the dam. So I just, I just wanted to be a voice of advocacy. This isn't unique to what the county is going through. They're not. You guys aren't colluding here. I think everybody's doing everything they can within the constraints that they have. That's just what I would say. All right. Thank, Thank you, Susan. Susan. Chris. So I'm on both sides of this. Like I had a, I live in a neighborhood where we had a house burglarized, and the person who burglarized the house ended up getting picked up later on a probation violation, and was housed in Reedsport. And I was very grateful for that, that he had about a month worth of consequences. I would have liked a lot more consequences, but mm -hmm. I'll take what I can get. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm appreciative of this program. It's effective. The money is going towards a good cause. However, um, I would imagine this $10,000 is, is for the next year. When does this start? There, what is it, the 10,000 that's being asked for? We overstepped in terms of the, give us the ability if we need to. So going forward, that's what this money's for. Yeah, because I said we had to house two, we pay for one bed. We used to pay for more, but we had a budget reduction. So we pay for one, we needed the option because I had two people that committed crimes that we needed help. And they didn't, we didn't want to make sure they were moved to where they were going. One was returned to another state, and I think the other one was in state prison. So um, did not want them returning to the community until it was adjudicated and we removed that one. So, I mean, this is a good cause, but this money would be better kept in the county, and I think that's what the gentleman right there was getting towards. Um, so I'm reading from the, the ballot measure that you guys voted on and have added to the May 21st ballot. It says... It's r it would raise money for an additional 49 beds over its current 98 bed capacity. And then I'm reading from a flyer that John Sweet and Gabe put out. Um, it says, the current operating capacity of the jail allows the sheriff's office to only hold 98 adults in custody. So 98, 98, we hear that a lot. I checked the jail roster this morning and there's 49 people in the jail. Is it, is, are there 49? 49 people in the jail. So. Which is it? You're telling us it's 98. Which it is. is it's that 49, and then you're giving money to Reedsport to house people, and then you're yelling at citizens when they complain, hey, why isn't that money going to fund our jail in our <coughs> community? It's very confusing. And I mean, as a citizen, I don't really appreciate when, when the leaders get upset with us for asking questions. You know, like, it's not easy to come up here. I'm a little shaky right now. I'm nervous. I don't like public speaking. Um, and he's asking a very valid question, like what the heck are we doing sending money to Reedsport? And I understand in years past, we haven't had the jail deputies, we haven't had the money, but, but we do now, the ballot measure you guys put out, the wording you put out says we are at 98 beds, but there's only 49 well, inmates in the jail right now. Let me explain. We have funding for 98 beds. That's not what this says. It says there's 98 beds. We have funding for that to go to 98 beds. However, until we get additional officers trained, we're still at 48. 
and sometime in this month, we will have those back and initially trained, not experienced, but initially trained, and we can go to the 98 beds. Now, if the levy passes, we would hope to go to roughly 150 beds. So what is the today's capacity of the jail? It's probably about 48, 49, somewhere in there. So this was filed with the clerk's office a month ago. But Why does it say current 98 bed capacity? Because that's what it's funded for. Because it's a lie? No, Sorry, I didn't that's that what correctly. it's funded for. Okay, well, it doesn't say funding anywhere on this document. I didn't write that, but I'm telling you, well, that's what it's funded did. for. It's signed by Colton, the, the attorney, Yeah. and I believe it was drafted by John Sweet, and you all voted unanimously on it. Mm -hmm. So when you vote on something that you don't understand, that, that's a problem. Oh, I understand it perfectly, Chris. It doesn't it's sound that. like it, because you're saying there's 48 <laughs> bed capacity. Okay, I've explained it several years, times. Okay, thank yeah. you. Um, why can't we going forward, you said the jail is supposed to open this month to 98 beds. Why can't we start keeping those people here? Why would we approve $10,000 to go to Reed's Court? We, that's going to be looked at when and if the levy passes and then Michael reevaluate the whole system. Because we'll that's why, ones. because of the shortage of beds, that's why we had to go to Reed's Court in the first place. So you're saying we'll open this month without the levy to 98 beds, correct? Yeah, until the end of June. What happens in June? Then we're short $4 million in general fund. And how does that affect the jail? It's mostly because that's the biggest part of the general fund, which are road deputies, jail deputies, dispatch, et cetera, DAs, <coughs> they take up most of the general fund. So they would be the ones who would have the bigger part of the cuts, unfortunately. So if we open this month to 98 beds and the levy does not pass in May, what happens Rack to the jail capacity in June? Back to 48. Thank you. Okay, any other discussion in the room? Any discussion online? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate you, the Sheriff's Office. Uh, 4I, additional appropriations for donation from Coos Bay North Bend Rotary. This donation is for safety equipment in the jail. Good morning, Sheriff. Good morning, Commissioner. Thank you. Took most of my, my speaking time. <laughs> Correct, this was a grant that was given us by Coos Bay North Bend Rotary. We've actually already accepted it, but um, I failed to put in there the first time that to ask for it to be an appropriations amount that goes back into the jail fund before we spend it. That was $9,960, um, like I said, for safety equipment, which will benefit both the, uh, not just the deputies, but any combative inmate that's a proven safety device, basically. So just uh, requesting approve and sign resolution 24-03-050 uh, boy, which is the appropriations. I move that we approve and sign resolution 23-03-050-B, uh, providing for additional appropriations for a donation from the Coos Bay North Bend Rotary Club for safety equipment in the jail. First and a second, any discussion on the board? Any discussion in the room? Online? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, uh, 4J, additional appropriations for vehicle repair, Sheriff. It was a little more confusing. Um, with the difficulty in finding vehicles these days, we're having to get pretty creative. Unfortunately, we've had a few vehicles crash um, within the last 12, or actually since July, excuse me, and have been reimbursed for them. So I'm asking for appropriations to use that money from the insurance companies to buy back one of the vehicles that um, the main problem I've had was that the airbags deployed. So. This will help cover stuffing those airbags back in and getting it back on the road. It's um, for us pretty much a brand new vehicle, so it'll be a benefit to keep it. Um, so requesting resolution to add the amount in 22353 and that's an aggregate of a couple of vehicle payouts to capital outlay in automobiles. Uh, in order to buy back one of the vehicles and bring it back into service, that'll include both the buyback amount from the insurance company and repair costs. Um, so. Approving sign, asking for approving sign resolution 
051B and 2403052B. Move approval as stated. Second. Okay, first and second. Any discussion on the board? These police vehicles aren't worth much for the insurance, are they? No, sir. <laughs> wow. That's a cheap buy off. Good. Any discussion in the room? <coughs> Anything online? Seeing none. All in favor? No. Aye. Aye. Sheriff's Office 4K payment of CCSO fuel bill. Uh, same as the last few months, we'll just request the board, Question Board to approve spending authority not to exceed $20,000 in order to pay the Coos County Sheriff's Office fuel bill for the month of April. A motion? Motion to approve spending authority not to exceed $20,000 in order to pay the County Sheriff's fuel bill for the month of April. Second. Any discussion on the board? Nope. In the room? Any discussion online? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Sheriff. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Sheriff. Okay, planning 4L, order adopting official road name of Two Crows Lane. Excuse me. Morning. Morning. Good morning. How are you, Amy? I'm good. Good. So this is in the matter of adoption of an official name of a road, the Two Crows Lane, located off of Morrison Road, southeast of the city of Danville. I move we adopt an official name of a road, Two Crows Lane, located off of Morrison Road, southeast of the city of Bandon, and do this through uh, approval of uh, resolution or order number 2403-013-PL. second. Any discussion on the board? Any discussion in the room? Anyone online? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, 4M, a memorandum of understanding between Coos County and the Oregon DCBS Building Codes Division. This memorandum of understanding is between Coos County and the Department of Consumer and Business Services, the Building Codes Division, for the transfer of the three employees that um, came over with the building program. This is the transfer of the funds for their vacation and and sick leave retained by the affected employees along with the transfer of their employee files. Okay. Motion? I move we accept uh, the memorandum of understanding for the transfer of employees, the transfer of funds for the vacation and sick leave retained by affected employees and authorized director to sign. Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion on the board? So as I understand this, uh, we are transferring employees that were from the state to the county right. to man our uh, new building. Originally, the, tr the list of employees were Leslie, Carol, Randy Jones, and Jason Olson. And Randy Jones expired. Retired? Okay. <laughs> we're glad he didn't expire. <laughs> I'm sorry. Retired um, in December. Hmm. Okay. Um, they're, re <laughs> they're also reimbursing us for the sick time and vacation time that they were allotted to bring over with them. Okay. okay. Any discussion in the room? Any online? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. No. Right. Okay, let's uh, go ahead with your late agenda item, please, 6B, uh, Planner 1 job description. So community development currently has two permit specialist, specialist positions. One is under the planning line item, hand, um, handling mostly the land use, and the other is under the building side. So um, since the two divisions are pretty different, we are choosing to keep them separate as opposed to cross-screening them. So we are trying to, but we are asking to laterally move um, the permit specialist under the planning will be titled to planner one. Um, it, we're not asking for a reclassification or um, a pay grade change. It's going to be the same. He's just going to laterally move just to planning instead of building anything. 
Okay. Move to approve job description for Planner 1 of the Craig Grade 416, approve and sign payroll transfer <laughs> resolution 24-03-056P, effective April 1st, 24. Second. Any discussion on the board? Nope. Any discussion in the room? Online? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Have a wonderful day. IT. Item number 4N, request approval to renew Cisco Duo. We all love Cisco Duo. Good morning, commissioners. Um, you basically said it. Cisco Duo is a, um, uh, a program and some hardware and applications. What it does when you log in, you are challenged on the device through the system, and then you can acknowledge that, that yes, that is you logging into that device. It's installed on all of our laptops, computers, servers. It's installed on our um, remote email, and it's also installed on our um, uh, the firewall where the users connect um, via an encrypted channel. Uh, this is a something that we do. Our insurance company mandates that we do it. It's, uh, that way, hackers can't get a hold of your username and password and log in as a user. Um, Roughly two-thirds of that is paid by the IT, the Coos County's IT budget, and then the other third is paid for out of um, Coos Health and Wellness's IT software maintenance. Um, this is a one-year uh, extension of our support and licensing agreement. Um, the total amount is $11,182.50, and CDWG is the authorized um, reseller that we get it. Move to approve renewal of Cisco dual license in amount of eleven thousand one hundred eighty two dollars and fifty cents from CDWG. Second. First and a second. Um, I am amazed at the efficacy of the duo setup. It's incredible to me how fast it works, the variety of circumstances, whether you're uh, cabled to the network, whether you're Wi-Fi, whether you're even outside of, I mean, not connected to any internet, and I don't understand how it knows what the, what the uh, number code is, if you have to use that, it's amazing. Uh, but that's, that's one thing that I want to say. Second thing I want to say is the amazement that I have at the efficacy of, of network connection while, while remote and whatever we're doing, we're able to get into the network and, and access the resources that we need almost 100% of the time. And it's it's an amazing job that you do. So thank you, Darius. You're welcome. And we do have team. some challenges. We're trying, yeah, we do have some challenges we're trying to overcome. Um, but it's important that no matter where county staff is, that they're able to do their jobs and serve the public. And yep. we strive for that daily to, to, to maintain that as best we can. And your striving is not fruitless. Thank you. Any other discussion on the board? In the room? Anybody online? No, uh, no Cisco competitors logging in to uh, <laughs> tender their objections? All in favor? No. Aye. Aye. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Very Chair, good. move Thank to you. approve the consent calendar. Second. Second and uh, first and second. Any discussion on the consent calendar? No. Nope. All in favor? Aye. 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 And we have one other late agenda item. We Hope Village. However, Hope Village. Yep. Commissioner Maine. The Hope Village Salvation Army wanted a support letter uh, for their new housing project, which we already have allocated $480,000 of specific funds for that project. And they will have that project on their site there in Empire and uh, we'll be closely monitoring all four of those units for families mm -hmm. and they wanted a, a support letter at all to uh, a, a obtain additional funds I assume. And the money comes from the uh, grant that right. The county and the city's received right, for right. homelessness. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep, homeless grant. So three. I move we approve and sign the letter of support. I will second that motion. Any other discussion? 
Any discussion in the room? like David Kaufman and all that, and we do go to those meetings and stuff, and I am in support of the Salvation Army and this homeless, yeah. this hope, whatever, for these families. I think they will do a good job with the money, mm -hmm. job with, you know, vetting people and all that. So I just wanted to say I supported them. Thank you, Thank you so much. Yeah, the program uh, balances uh, meeting, meeting physical needs and also the meeting spiritual needs and having a, an accountability structure. So it's just the kind of program that we want to see and support as a community to help people who have uh, been put to the margins for whatever reasons to find their way back to a central path uh, as contributing members of society. And so um, yeah, your comments are well taken, Nancy. Thank you. Anybody else? Comments? All right, all in favor? Oh, oh. hold on. Yep. Go ahead, Tim. I just wanted to know if Susan Kim, Pearson. Yeah, just thank you. Uh, Tim Pierce, Bandon. Where is this uh, Hope Village it's, supposed to be? It's on the uh, property of the Salvation, o of, uh, the Salvation Army facility that's up off of um, uh, Shoneman yeah. Drive in Coos Bay. Wouldn't it be better located right next to the City Hall of Coos Bay? Well, uh, you know, the City Hall doesn't have any involvement <laughs> in this particular <laughs> program. And yeah, if it was on, I'll point, point out that if it was on, on, if it was on City Hall property that the uh, religious aspect of, of oh, this program oh, would not be able to be I'm, utilized. So I'm being just a little facetious about yes, this. I just I think that most homeless camps and all this should be put where the people that are responsible for creating this mess. I don't disagree with you. Anyway, thank you. All right, thank you. All right, so uh, any other discussion on this agenda item? None online, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, we're gonna move right into uh, uh, commissioner's reports. Commissioner Maine, do you have anything to? Uh, most importantly, last Friday I was honored to be invited to the uh, Vietnam Veterans Celebration, mm. Remembrance, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, they had a quite a parade that went all over Bandon. I happened to be towards the back of the parade. It was a lot of fun. They went to the some of the retirement centers. They went down through downtown. They went around the park, all over the place. And then afterwards, they, well, then they had a dedication at, at the park for the memorial fund, or memorial. Uh, just thinking about <laughs> too much where the monument is, where they have the people on the wall. The DeWitt Memorial, oh, the. No, no, the that's out north of North Bend. Oh, yeah. you're talking about the Vietnam Memorial. Yes, yeah. they're at, at the park and they're abandoned and had a lot of names on the wall, local folks. That some of them I went to school with. Mm -hmm. um, very emotional. Um, mm -hmm. Beautiful day for it, though. And then we all went back and uh, had a fellowship barbecue, and that was great, too. Nice. It was a great time. Well, Me? All right. Um, a good part of the last couple of weeks has been spent um, in support of our proposed public safety levy. Uh, the sheriff, the district attorney, and I have uh, been spending probably a couple of evenings a week uh, in a few daytimes uh, talking to uh, almost any group that would have us. And uh, uh, reception's been uh, good. Uh, we've received great questions. Uh, Hopefully we're able to respond to them to the satisfaction of those who ask, but I'll say not in all cases have we been able to get everyone on board, but I think it's a challenge and we're moving forward with it. Uh, attended a meeting uh, with the South SLU. They have, um, uh, they always have someone from the county on, on their board. Uh, I'm stepping down from that position. Bob held it before me 
and um, they've asked that uh, Lance Morgan, our uh, county forester, uh, fill that position going forward. Um, there was a meeting uh, at the Mill Casino on the 21st of March. It was put together by local people that are interested in housing. They did a great job. They had invited a, a lot of um, people from the various housing programs that the state and federal government has, and there are several uh, housing projects on the books that, that require that type of funding, federal and state assistance. Um, and, and so those pe uh, people were from those agencies were there and were able to respond to questions that local people involved in these um, in these um, developments have. An example of one such development is the old school, well, what's the district in Coos Bay? Inglewood, the old Inglewood School that um, years ago was sold by the school board to a private individual. Uh, they had a fire. It left behind uh, a, a lot of environmental issues. Uh, the owner uh, decided against uh, cleaning it up and decided instead to skip town. And uh, so the county ended up with that uh, property in our uh, portfolio. Uh, we worked with the city of Coos Bay to put together a program where uh, they would take title to it. They would clean it up uh, very, with funds that they had access to and time, uh, management time that we didn't have uh, and, and then uh, develop that for low cost housing. So that was an example of a type of um, uh, opportunity to provide. And the emphasis is um, largely on um, housing for everyone, but largely on housing for um, uh, you know, people, we have school teachers that can't find a place to live here, so we need more housing. So, um, so that was one of the things I was involved with. Um, Would there be property tax? I, good, I, yeah, you see, I'm trying to, I don't know who, Tom, who's gonna end up in the ownership of that. If I think the city has the property. I, I don't know if they're planning to sell it to a developer or, or just how that will work. Uh, sorry, I don't know more about it. But, um, Spent some time at the fairground with our, our staff down there and, and trying to line that out, uh, prioritizing projects. We have lots to do there to fully upgrade our fairgrounds and uh, we have a good deal, a good number of volunteers working on that. And then this week we started our second round of uh, budget hearings for the year starting July 1. And uh, we've spent, uh, spent uh, yesterday, uh, they start again this afternoon, and hopefully we'll complete those by the end of the week. Um, I think that's all I have. Okay. Well, um, I was uh, I was out for a week, and uh, so had some uh, limited interactions. As Commissioner Sweet just mentioned, we did begin our second round of budget hearings yesterday and it will continue this afternoon at 1.30. Uh, for the benefit of those of you who may have been interested in joining those budget hearings without having to be in the room, those are posted now that there will be a go-to just like the Board of Commissioners meetings and the links for both today and tomorrow's sessions are on the county calendar on the county website. Uh, <clears throat> the budget process is, uh, is it's it's very uh, it's tragic and painful to consider what we may be facing if the if the levy doesn't pass and this is the consequence as I've said multiple times and as I said in the uh, in the budget statement at the opening of yesterday's hearings that the the budgetary constraints that we are under right now is a result of Coos County assets being stolen, illegally taken by the federal government, the Bureau of Land Management, 
and by the State Board of Forestry. They have illegally taken the resources that are supposed to be appropriated for the benefit of Coos County and the original appropriation of those, uh, those timber receipts is the reason that we have a property tax base rate as low as we have. As has often been repeated from this dais and other places, we are the second lowest uh, base tax rate county in the state. And, and that's, not, that's not because it, it took uh, so little to run the county, it's because the timber receipts precluded the necessity of having uh, a, a higher property tax base rate. Now, I'm not advocating for higher taxes, quite the contrary. I think that the very low property taxes is a better approach. In fact, I prefer a model where there are no property taxes. Why should we have to continue to pay for what we've already purchased? I don't agree with that idea, but that's not my decision to make. The fact of the matter is that we are short $24 million versus what we should have been getting based on those timber receipts. So it was with great disappointment last week that we learned that the Supreme Court of the United States declined to hear our challenge case against the Bureau of Land Management and so we have run out of legal recourse, or so it would appear. So what strategies and tactics we undertake alongside with the other ONC counties in the state remains to be seen, but it's going to be something. Because I, for one, am not going to sit here and allow them to continue taking our resources without any repercussions or any any pushback. So what that looks like, I don't exactly know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But we cannot, look, the reality is that we cannot, even if we wanted to, we cannot raise property taxes enough to cover the services that are expected to be provided from the county. It's not possible. The numbers don't work. So the only recourse that we have is to reaccess those renewable resources that we should have access to and that we should have had access to all along. So that's what we're pushing for. Please join us for more uh, budgetary uh, sessions uh, later today and, and tomorrow. Uh, and uh, it'll be very instructive, informative, and we do really do appreciate public input and feedback. Several of you here have been uh, present in those and there have been good questions asked and uh, we really appreciate that. So that's all I have. Uh, well, may I just, on that? well we're, we're just going into public comments. So maybe can you just, let's just do that because you're third on the list, okay? Did you have something else you <coughs> want to did. say, Bob? Um, most all of the, well, I'm the vice president of the ONC Association representing the West Vernon counties. And like Rod said, we had hoped last week Friday that we would get a court date from the Supreme Court of the United States to hear our case and they didn't want to hear it for weird reasons. Um, it all, all the problems we have, almost all the problems of non-utilization of the resource of the ONC timber of two plus million acres of grant, timber land stems from Washington, D.C. Now we do have the state of Oregon doing some stuff that Rod and I and John don't agree with, the ACP and the private forest accord and all that other stuff, which limits private timber uh, to be harvested, et cetera. Although I think that should be appealed when you do a taking of private land because you say you can't utilize that anymore for growing trees because we're restricting it means you're doing a taking. The Supreme Court in the Arkansas versus U.S. government case, first time ever in the history of the United States, Supreme Court said partial taking has to be compensated for. So I'm trying to get some of the timber companies and whoever else to join in and say, oh, wait a minute, you took all this, you either pay us or give it back. Okay, go ahead, Rob. 
Okay, thank you for that. So let's go right into uh, citizen comments. Phil Thompson, first on the list. Hey, Phil. Hi. Phil Thompson, Cruz Bay. I was going to decline, but after your speech about the, you know, the land, timber land and stuff, uh, Everything starts right here, guys. We can't blame the people. It's already kept on We tell them that uh, no matter what the Republicans or Democrats, if they don't do the job, we should have a concentrated effort to get rid of them. I mean, uh, this Manning guy spoke here at the Democrat meeting here the other day. He talked about public lands. They belong to the people. You know, and even right here in Cruz County, we're violating a lot of stuff on the public plans. Right? When you put up those gates and don't allow the citizen to use them. To me, I'm ready to get rid of all of your votes for that. And uh, I'm sorry I talked so rough. But that's the way it is. Uh, everything starts right here in the low level and goes up. So I say, let's get rid of the people that's not doing their job. You know? And, and I know the timber tax fell here just recently because uh, I think a lot of people in that AOC wasn't backing it right. Is that right, John? I don't know what timber tax you're talking about. Well, one, one we voted on here, what, two, two years ago, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, the, it was on the ballot, John. And, and uh, Timber they were going, yes, they were going to make the timber companies pay more taxes. Oh. I don't know that was Maybe you had quite an argument over there. Uh, yeah. No, I agree that the timber companies are not paying their share of local taxes. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I'm I, pretty I sure I would have been aware of that. I know there's been conversations, but I, I, I don't recall uh, the, the vote. Uh, yeah, well, we voted on it. It went down. Yeah. Uh, we we as members of this county, we don't or have we a of the state, or we of... <coughs> well, it was a state vote. Hmm. I don't recall that either. Well, I'm sorry, uh, guys, but bring we it back voted on it. Tax well, I'd like for to It's an Trump important stuff. issue. Yeah. Well, and one of the things that, that you mentioned, Phil, is it, you mentioned AOC, the Association of Oregon Counties. That's right failed to back the correct position on the tax. Is that what you're saying? Well, the way I look at it, uh, you're never going to get the timber companies to pay the tax as mm -hmm. long as we got these things like the AOC and stuff. Uh, Douglas County is not going to institute no uh, help institute a tax on the timber companies. Neither is Lane and neither is Coop. I don't think you guys, uh, when it come right down to cutting them little things, you know, no. Well, I, I, I can't speak for the other commissioners here, but I can certainly say that I am in favor of, of a timber tax equally impacting and affecting all timber operators. If there's going to be a severance tax, it should impact all operators equally. And the fact of the matter is that there is unequal treatment right now with the larger uh, companies who have over 5,000 acres taxed at a different rate. That's, that's wrong. It shouldn't be so, and I'll stand right here in front of God and every, anybody and say that. I don't, care, I don't care how much land they have or how powerful or rich they are, I'll speak the truth. That's fact. The smaller timber companies uh, is taxed differently, and you got a lot of the big timber companies. What is it? Uh, I forget how hard it is. It's a return on investment. Uh, uh, we call it. ROI. Anyway, uh, they got that in there, which now it, they might put it out there another 50 years before they pay taxes or something. Depend, return on investment and so forth. Uh, they got a great break here 30 or 40 years ago, and, and we've never gotten back to them. They, they have just they, they've done everything from the end to end infrastructure to, well, you know, just 
they broke the counties and stuff. So we shouldn't have to say, you know, this or that. We put them on us, get them out. And right. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. Chris, you're next. Sorry to be petty about this, but it really drives me nuts. By the way, I'm Chris Castleman from Cuco. Um, I mentioned it two weeks ago, and Rod, you just said it again. We're the second lowest base tax rate in the state, but we're just not. And the part, like, you guys are leaders, and I'd like to be able to trust you. And so when I heard that months ago, I looked into it and I met with John and he gave me his notes. These are his photocopied notes. We went over them and, it, and we're not second, we're third. Like okay. Our ba base tax rate is 1.08. Curry County is 0.6 and Josephine is 0.59. All right, so for the benefit of the room, I will, I will amend my comments. We are not the second lowest base tax rate county in the state, we are the third. All Thank right. you. Thank you. I know go. that's petty. I just don't understand why it's I say second if we're third. It's like uh, drives me uh, nuts. You know, let me tell you why it's second. Yeah. We have, we have a base tax rate. That's called the permanent rate, Chris. Right. Then on top of the permanent rate, you have what they call local local option levy, and those are what we we have that will be paid off here this year to support construction of a emergency radio system here within the county. And then you have bond levy. So you have to, to find out what your county tax bill is. You have to add together your permanent rate, which is our dollar and eight cent rate, our local option tax, which is our uh, the 20 cent rate that we have to build the emergency communications tower and any bonds we have. So our combined rate, we have no bonds right now. We have a lease that will pay off this year, uh, but the, the, our permanent rate and that lease, the total rate is $1.28. That is the second lowest such rate in the state. So, so clarify, you, 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 there are more taxes than the permanent rate. To clarify earlier, Rod said the base tax rate, which is. But I didn't. I said. And the, you have Okay, but I, I said I, the rate. I have asked you for that information because you're explaining Coos County, and then you're comparing that to other counties. So you'd have to go and analyze every county, get their permanent rate, and then add on top of that all of their option levies. I have all that. of their. I gave you the. You scribble. didn't. You gave me just their base tax rate. We sat for like an hour and went through this. And the state of Oregon, the Department of Revenue, they do that analysis that you're talking about. They take the actual tax bill, like your base rate plus all the other stuff you pay, and they did an analysis, which I looked into. That puts us at 10th out of 36. At what? It puts us at 10th lowest out of 36 counties. We pay an average a value of $13.23 per 1,000 assessed value. That's what our average tax bill is in this county. When you compare that to other counties, we're 10. So it just, the, the narrative gets worse. And Chris, it you're giving out mind. bad information. It's from the Department of Revenue. Listen to me for oh a second. Oh my goodness. Okay. How about you put out the good information then? Where's your the information? information I'm talking about is so. the, what we have control over is our county tax rate. Try to listen, Chris. I've the thirteen dollars includes the rates of the yeah. schools, the cities, the ports, the hospitals, all those other things. I welcome you to put that information out there for the public to see how you calculate that we're second. Because I don't see that information anywhere. Right. I asked you for that information and you did not provide it to me. Secondly, you mentioned that our base tax rate is so low because we relied on the O and C land hear that a lot. We relied on that revenue from the federal government. Our base tax rate for this county was set in 1853 when our county was incorporated. The ONC Act was in 1916. 
1937. 1937. Even worse for you. Like, it, it was way later, after our base tax rate was set. So they don't have anything to do with one another. Also, our ONC funding ended in about 2006, 2007, almost 20 years ago. This has been a Coos County problem for over 20 years. Not over, sorry, about 22 years it has been an issue. Then the wow, SRS started. 18 years. Then the SRS started, which was a stopgap for non-payment of ONC uh, tax, timber receipts. It's, it's just a lot of in misinformation coming out that Actually we're not. simply in this because of the ONC lands and our base tax rate. And I wish you guys would be more clear. Um, I appreciate your transparency for airing the budget meetings today and tomorrow. Um, Rod worked on that, and I really appreciate that. Um, I also have had many discussions with Coos Bay City Manager, North Bend City Manager, the mayors, about how they run their meetings. You guys run your meetings very differently. You allow this back and forth, and I appreciate it, so John and I can argue with one another. It Honestly, like I've been telling the other, the other cities, um, it works. You guys have shown a model that allows open dialogue even when you disagree with the person standing here, and I commend you for that, and I appreciate it. Um, part of the problems in the cities is where we don't have our voices heard. Um, even though you allow us to talk here, you know, earlier we talked a lot about the money going to, towards Coos Health and Wellness. We don't feel like our voices are being heard. Um, so some friends and I got together and we formed what we call the Coos County Citizens Council. Uh, we held our first meeting uh, a week ago and we have planned meetings every two weeks. Um, we're looking to kind of get our voices heard and come together and uh, get things moving in the county because it doesn't seem like our leaders are fixing certain problems. So the first thing we did at our meeting last week was we signed a resolution or a letter, so to speak. Um, I'm gonna read it uh, right now and I can hand you guys copies. This is to the City of Coos Bay, City of North Bend, County of Coos, and the Board of the Nancy Devereaux Center. The success of our community is dependent upon the willingness of individuals and organizations to hold themselves accountable for their actions, and in some cases, their failure to act. The Nancy Devereaux Center was once a blessing to a community in need, and while they still may have good intentions, the current management style has turned the organization into a center of blight. The Devereaux Center mission statement speaks of strengthening and improving relationships with appropriate community services, local government, public safety partners, and our neighbors. It is our hope that they take considerable strides over the next few months to improve their relationship with their neighbors, and not only through words, but through decisive action. Here are four solutions we urge you to implement immediately. Hire a security guard, to keep the company or keep the property free of drugs, prostitution, and loitering after hours. Uh, number two, seize the handouts of free camping gear that your clients illegally use and then abandon in our backyards. Number three, implement a program to help clean up your clients' abandoned property from neighboring properties and sidewalks. Lastly, number four, require full state and federal background checks for potential housing fines and deny acceptance to applicants with active warrants. These are not complicated or unreasonable requests, and we demand that you take them seriously to avoid further action to shut down the Devereaux Center entirely. There are many organizations in this area addressing homelessness and mental health who have proven themselves to be successful community partners, such as the Salvation Army. If the management of the Devereaux Center is unwilling or unable to cooperate effectively with their community, then they no longer have a purpose here in Coos County. Accordingly, we demand that the City of Coos Bay, City of North Bend, Coos Health and Wellness, and the Coos County Homeless Task Force seize all current and planned partnerships with the Nancy Devereaux Center until they have implemented the above suggested actions at their Empire and Full Bank locations. This includes the $67,000 per year contract that Coos County pays the Devereaux Center to rent three pallet homes, and I'll add that those pallet homes were built for $10,000 each. 
a one-time fee. This includes the $1.5 million grant money the City of Coos Bay and City of North Bend has been trying to give to the Devereux Center for an expansion program. We care about our neighborhoods. We care how they, how they look, how they smell, how they sound, and how safe they feel. We are not against giving someone a hand up, but the practice at the Devereux Center of giving handouts has not been successful, and it needs to be reorganized if it can, and disbanded if it cannot. We hope you choose to be better. Uh, and who are we? We are a grassroots collective of concerned citizens. We are your neighbors, your local business owners, moms and dads, college grads, and lifelong tradesmen. We represent the everyday citizen. Our values and vision has, have not been properly represented in government, and our individual pleas for change, as they were done today, have not been taken seriously. We have formed this collective in order to stand together in hopes that our message will finally be heard and understood and so our communities can achieve new potential through common sense solutions. Signed, the Coos County Citizens Council. Um, there's about 50 signatures, I believe. Um, it's not a massive petition or anything by that standard. It's not even official, but we really do hope you take it seriously. Um, <laughs> I'll be presenting that tonight to the city of Coos Bay um, and then the following week to the city of North Bend. Um, the budget meeting on Wednesday, I believe, goes over Coos Health and Wellness budget. Um, I, I sincerely hope you do not fund uh, the $67,000 for, for three pallet homes going forward into the next fiscal year. Um, I hope you do not continue to give them grant money um, and access to those funds. I understand they are not direct Coos County funds. They come from the state or federal grant money. Um, but they should not go to an enabling organization. Um, I feel like I've taken up a lot of your time, so I, I really don't want to talk much about the other stuff. I mean, the public safety levy, it, it, it's really important. It's really important for you guys to be honest with people and explain what happens if that passes and, and if it doesn't. Um, you guys mentioned asking this, that other, s other counties have cities paying for the jail. If that's, a, if that's a thing that works, come with me to the meeting tonight to Coos Bay. I'll, I'll stand up there and we can all go up to the podium and urge them to do that. Um, not only are you leaders, but you're also citizens and you guys can give citizen comment. Um, John's been at those meetings before advocating for the public safety levy, but what's the backup plan? If that doesn't pass, Ro uh, uh, Bob stated earlier, we're gonna open the jail this month to 98 beds and then lay off all the people that he worked so effing hard to hire. We're gonna lay them off in June. That's not a plan. July. That's a horrible, July. horrible July. idea. July. <laughs> yep. I hear you. Okay, Come so Chris, plan, Chris, tax rates, tax rate Curry, 0.5996 for Curry County, no local option levies. Josephine. 16267, their base rate is 0.5867. They have two local option levies, one 11.11 and the other is 0.93 for law enforcement, which gives them a total of 16267. Coos, 1.0799 was, and plus 0.2 for the tower upgrades, which for handle police, fire, and ambulance. So, Curry's the lowest, then Coos is after that, including a local option levy, and then Josephine is third. This is from Greg Kramer, Oregon Department of Revenue, last Friday. Right, so, so you've explained this three counties. Yep. There are 33 more. Yep, and, and they're all higher. <laughs> Just put that per Greg Kramer there. from the Oregon but Department that's of Revenue. That's the base rate, that's the permanent rate plus option levy. Yeah. It's just, you're, you confuse people when you say they're the second lowest. Well, if the base rate is third means. lowest, but the combined rate is the second lowest. Explain that to people and also put out the information. I'm doing it right department. now, but you're not listening very well. I hear you. <laughs> you're saying <laughs> okay, our permanent Chris. rate puts us at third, and with the option levies, it puts us at second. I'm not I here to debate. I just We're told you. I'm explaining so that. we are Thank among very the much. very, very lowest property tax rates in the state. So that's a... Thank That's you. an accurate statement. There right. You go. Thank you, Chris. Thank All right, Jim, you're next. 
Jimmy, morning. it's still morning, yeah. Yeah. So I just want to point out to you that uh, uh, as we go up this uh, treasonous bureaucratic food chain at the top, uh, uh, part of sustainable development is sustainable debt loads. I couldn't believe it. See, they use the same uh, MO with individuals as they do with little towns as they do with counties, as they do with cities and states and entire countries. They orchestrate their debt because it makes them easier to control. So I'm going to read the disclaimer on the National Policy Consensus Center. Cautionary note, participation is the key to legitimacy. Government-sponsored consensus processes are not the traditional forms in which policies are made administered or educated in a democracy. In traditional forums, the mechanisms for determining who participates directly in the writing and administration of law are spelled out in constitutions, charters, statutes, and rules. I'll point out that the last three are all subordinate to the first. And then in bold red writing, it says consensus seeking processes are adjuncts adjunct definition, unnecessary additions. Our uh, uh, consensus-seeking processes are adjuncts to traditional democratic processes, uh, pr processes. They can shift the focus of public decision-making. So translated, what they're doing is, in an attempt to hold themselves harmless, there's, they're transferring the exposure to you guys so that they can lend legitimacy through the color of law to acts of war. And if you think I'm exaggerating using it, calling it acts of war, I'll try to wrap off a few. I just learned that the country of Canada and Australia commissioned these liberals in Portland on the National Policy Consensus Center to justify those enormous fires. I thought I was awake. I couldn't believe it. They call it returning. Which well, it's rural cleansing, right? It, it, returning the, you know, they'll use stuff like returning the forest to pre-white settlement condition and stuff like that. <laughs> they'll deliberately burn us out. They'll take the water away. That's how you pick winners and losers in a rural environment. They use the consensus crap for the dam removal. And I don't know if you read any articles on it, but to call it a uh, environmental catastrophe wouldn't be exaggerating in the slightest. They've scrubbed the truth and censored. You could search the subject for 15 pages, and all you'll find is warm and fuzzy language about saving the salmon, where the salmon are all dead, and the stakeholders that are involved in moving the water to California, which is what it's really about, uh, yeah, but they're, they're all stakeholders. It's time we stop looking at this like, you know, in, in their fake, uh, uh, with their fake interest in humanity, the people, or the environment. They don't care about any of it. They'll burn us out, they'll flood us. They'll create mosquito refuge, refuge uh, habitat so that they have they can justify spraying us like bugs. I talked to Bob about this a few months ago. I've seen this movie before. We're at war. These are all acts of war. The hour is late. Re regarding it as anything other than that, they're all instruments of economic warfare unusual warfare. We're at war. And I support you in uh, siding with the people. And I know, I know you guys want to. But um, the whole, the good news is that the, the whole political polarity of our country is going to shift. And if anybody doesn't think so, I'm taking bets. We can square up over the holidays. Make sure that we pick the right team of 
this crucial, significant time, and I'll, I'm going. I know you want to, and I know it's not easy, but we're entangled, in effect. We're hitching our wagon to the people that are behind everything that's wrong on planet Earth. Why would we want to have them dictating policy and pulling the strings in our community? Everything they touch will go bad. Anyway, well wishes to everybody. Jim. Thank you, Dean. Jim. Jim. So just so you know, and I didn't realize this until a little bit ago, the Heritage Foundation put out information about your 401k that you invest in. Did you know that the investment companies that you put your 401k in can go use your money for investing in derivatives? If those derivatives go close up, the investment companies are in the first position and you, the investor, are in the last position. Imagine that. In, you know, the information part of the war is going pretty good. People are a lot more awake now than they were three or four years ago. It's true. But institutions, is that what they meant by principalities in the Bible? Uh, no. <coughs> you don't think so? No. We fight not against fresh flesh and blood, but against evil in high places and principalities. What did you think it meant? Well, principalities has a very specific theological definition, and it has to do with uh, things in the spiritual realm. It doesn't have to do with uh, governments that, that people organize and, and uh, utilize for the public good. That's, that's not what it's about. Oh, an apology. I'll look it up when I leave. But I think you understand the spirit of what I'm saying. Sure. Institutionally, the takeover, the coup of our country, in my he estimation, is 90-something percent complete. I mean, start at the bottom. Boys Club, Girls Club, Chamber of Commerce, the whole medical landscape, the whole educational landscape, to include our universities that have been weaponized. Mm -hmm. We've got to unhitch from their wagon, because their wagon goes to a bad place. Yeah, agreed with that, and uh, and this this is uh, largely what's behind the comment that I've made so often. That uh, particularly since becoming a commissioner, I see with even greater clarity how legislation uh, that comes down from the state and federal level is so frequently uh, has an element of it that that disempowers local governments and transfers that power and control to state control. to state and federal governments. Uh, contrary to the will of the people. Right. And your consensus, the consensus process that you articulate is, is uh, largely responsible for that. So thanks for your comments, appreciate it. Anybody else who did not sign up today care to make a comment? Sure. Yes, please do, sir. And I'm looking online too, in case anybody wants to speak online, please raise your hand and we will get to you next. Yes, sir. I will introduce my full title, Sergeant First Class Andrew D. Bight, retired. I've listened to a lot of the conversation, and after retirement, I turned into a defense contractor. I want to commend you for your patience today in a lot of the conversation and what I will say is accusations that were inaccurate. Grants are not done by this county, ladies and gentlemen. Grants are done by groups, individuals, yeah. and federal. They don't control them. They don't control who gets them. They have some control of how they're utilized. People need to understand the difference in how funds are allocated. When you get into what this gentleman is saying, I have lived in the past about another country. We're addressing the dais, sir. Thank you. Okay. I have lived in combat. I've seen firsthand what other countries have gone through in similar situations. So as you get into budgets, what I would challenge everybody to be very familiar with, U.S. Code 26, U.S. Code Title 42. They deal in the colors of money of how the infrastructure and how funds are allocated. And when you got into the numbers earlier about our tax rate, I was tracking that we were second in the state lowest 
as you add all the other factors in, there are a lot of factors that go into budget, correct me if I'm wrong, that are not public comment. They're not posted. So you guys have more information and you're trying to relay that information. I just want to commend you guys on the job you're doing so far. I disagree with some of the comments made by others of trans lack of transparency. I don't see that. I've been back in Oregon since 2018. I grew up in Douglas County. So I have lived the timber industry. I understand the timber industry's impact of not having those resources. I want to cover how the budgets are looked at and how grants are looked at because I, I listen to people believing you control that when you really don't. You help manage how they allocate funds after they receive them from federal or institutions, not giving them the funds. Am I correct in that assessment? Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, thank you for your time. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. All right, anybody else care to comment? Tim, come on up. Still don't see any raised hands online. I just wanted to uh, apprise you gentlemen of something called the rain tax. There is a rain tax that's going on here. See, the state of Oregon thinks they own the rain, but yet they accept no liability for it. <laughs> rain kills more people than all other weather phenomena together. I don't know about you, but I don't normally allow things on my land that I can't use at my own discretion, including the rain. It is illegal in Oregon to catch rain now. It belongs to the state. But yet they accept no liability for the damage it does. I guess you were smiling over there, John. Uh, yeah, but uh, I'm, I'm smiling because I've had acres of bottom land. Well, yeah, <laughs> if, if you want to check out how devastating it is, check out the stormwater uh, treatment thing in Portland. They tore up the whole city and put massive drain pipes in and, 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 and stormwater processing and tax the people for the state's rain. I mean, this is insane. And it might be coming to a neighborhood near you, like Coquille. This little, this kind of garbage could actually bankrupt some whole towns. That's right. Anyway, thank you. All right, thank By you. By the way, thanks for letting everybody talk. This is so cool. I brag on you. Oh, thank you for that. All right. Anybody else who wishes to partake of this right of yours? Going once, going twice. All right, thank you very much for being here. We are adjourned. <laughs>